What's happening, Polite Society? I hope you had a good week. If you're here for the first time, welcome to my channel. I'm Alan. Once again, a big thank you to all of you who have been praying for me. I had been under the weather this past week, but I am feeling much better now. Next week, we'll continue our series on entertainment. But for today's video, I'd like to show you guys a segment from my July interview with my friend and dear brother in the Lord, Aramaic scholar Dr. Scott Callahan. In this portion from that interview, Dr. Callahan interacts with some arguments made by progressive scholar Peter Enns in relation to Jonah and Nahum. We now turn to take a look at an article. We're still on dealing with progressives, but an article written by a progressive scholar. He is popular in progressive circles, and his name is Dr. Peter Enns. I believe he currently holds a teaching position at Eastern University. Enns is an interesting case because he has written books at both the scholarly level for his colleagues at the academy, as well as, as the more at the more popular level for general audiences. Enns, of course, does not hold to the view of scripture, which conservative evangelicals hold to. But he has written an article on the book of Jonah. I provided a link to it below. In this article, he seems to be hinting that Jonah and Nahum are contradictory because they are based upon each author's individual experiences. He also writes that he prefers Jonah over Nahum because, and, because of N's own personal experiences about God. Mm -hmm. He also doesn't believe the events in Jonah took place historically because of the account of the whale and the post-exilic context. He believes that Jonah was written when the Jewish people became more accepting of their enemies in exile. So how can we interact with some of the arguments which Dr. Enns makes in this article? Mm. Well, this opens up a wonderful discussion here. So uh, I, th I think that people who are watching this should go ahead and read that article. Yeah. There's a lot of good content in the article, actually, until it gets to these points that we're going to discuss. So um, a well-presented article in the end, the direction it's going, of course, indicates a different view of the authority and sufficiency of scripture. And uh, Peter Enns is going to go with the historical critical assumption that Jonah is written after return from exile, whereas Nahum obviously has to be written before uh, because of this uh, destruction of, of Nineveh that happens. So, um, and, and a second part of that it, it's a corollary to that is because Jonah is written after exile, it has to reflect the situation at that time, rather than being an accurate story from another time. And th these are historical critical assumptions that evangelicals wouldn't share if they take the Bible at face value for what it's saying, you see. So about Jonah himself, it, it's, it's hard to say that this book is written in the exile time, unless you just dismiss that this is actually about Jonah, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing. It's very far removed from him, if that's the case. Um, Jeroboam II's reign was around 780 BC, and in 2 Kings 14.25, we have Jonah named, along with his father, Jonah, son of Amittai. <laughs> so that prophet, that time. So it, it has to be that time when it happens. And again, I, I think the fine distinction ends is making is well it could be set in that time but it reflects attitudes from later you know th this kind of thing so that that distinction is not something that would come to the mind of someone who's just reading the bible for face value okay but here's here's the thing this isn't the only time in the bible where we have an issue of what to do with foreigners that there is a what appears to be a theological shift so i, I think what ends is talking about is that is that in Nahum, there's a, uh, a hatred of the Ninevites, the Assyrians, for what they had done to Israel in the past. A, a righteous indignation, right? But by he's saying Jonah, which he's saying after, right? This is reflecting a new openness to foreigners because, well, they've had their exile experience in their back. I don't know that there's this wonderful openness to foreigners during the uh, after exile time. I mean, they're glad to be back in their land, but it's their land. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're not open to the Samaritans wanting to help them rebuild the temple, and they're partly Jews. I mean, you know, th in this way of thinking. So I don't know about, about this, uh, this posed situation, but I think we can look at um, other places in the Bible and appreciate a more biblical approach to attitudes towards foreigners and see 
God working through history to bring about the situation we have right now where Gentile believers like you and me can have a relationship with the God of Israel. Okay, so here we go. Um, and, and, and actually, this is without even bringing up the, the amazing, cool, historical irony. Assyrians now have a Christian identity, meaning they consider themselves to be Christians. There are evangelical Christians among the descendants of the Ninevites. <laughs> so, you know, the book of Jonah was talking about a, an actual repentance, an actual change of heart that happened before they were destroyed, before the city was destroyed. And it appears that all of that's forgotten by the time you get to the book of Nahum. But in God's amazing ways, later on, when the first missionary work begins uh, among Assyrians, they lash onto it. You know, so God has worked with that people in the Bible and since in a, in a pretty cool way. I mean, Assyrians are the, are the modern Aramaic speakers, for instance, you know, so the, the language of Jesus as it has developed to today. But anyway, let's go back to the Bible. So the way God wants foreigners to be viewed, the development of that. So in, we could just look, for example, to the attitude towards like the Moabites in the Torah. Numbers 22 to 24 has Balak, their king, bring Balaam in and say, curse those people, you know, and he can't because he's constrained by God from doing that. But then right afterwards, Numbers 25, 1 to 2 reads, and Israel remained at Shittim, and the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Well, what's so bad about that? It's just, you know, God whispers about such things. <laughs> No, indeed, they called the people to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So the connection with foreigners that God is emphasizing is it's bad because they're going to lead you to worship other gods. And sort of the Moabites are, are a big test case of that. But then you come to the book of Ruth. And you're like, wait a minute. This looks like a totally different view at, at first read. But the thing is, Ruth, who is emphasized to be a Moabite over and over throughout the book, ethnically speaking, she's a Moabite to the end, becomes a part of the people of God. Why? Well, she had the choice not to be at the beginning, like her sister-in-law. She chooses to stay for explicitly faith-based reasons. She swears on the name of Yahweh. You know, and her behavior from that point and the way the uh, author allows her to be characterized, it's obvious this is a Moabite who has come in to the people of God. And of course, she becomes David's ancestor, thus becoming the Messiah's ancestor. The salvation of the world includes the story of this Moabite. Okay, but then later in history, you get to the story um, of the interactions with the Moabites in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, the exile, you know, post-exile time that supposedly everyone's really happy with Gentiles. No, <laughs> <laughs> the, the intermarriage with the Moabites is a problem in Ezra and Nehemiah's time, including Nehemiah, it looks like, has to make a trip back to Persia. So he makes everybody promise, don't marry the foreigners in the land. So he, he goes, he comes back, and it looks like it actually wasn't very long that he was gone. And everybody is married foreigners is what it looks like. And not, obviously not everybody, but widespread marrying of foreigners, children who don't speak Hebrew. This is not a, a statement of ethnic pride. Nonsense. This is abandonment of their promise to God. This is unfaithfulness to God that they, they, would, they, they didn't even need to have that promise. I mean, they, they had the Torah you know, but they have broken their promise to God. So, you know, this is a development, again, in talking about the, uh, the Moabites. We have an example of a faithful one, a paradigmatic faithful one, and then we have an example of just proving once again that you marry those who are not coming into the community by faith, and you've got a problem. But then, look at this, this new covenant time that we're emphasizing over and over in just all of the things we've talked about today. Isaiah 19, 21 to 25. Look what it says about 
the new covenant time uh, attitude towards foreigners. Thus, Yahweh will make himself known to Egypt. And the Egyptians will know Yahweh in that day. They will even worship with sacrifice and offering, and they will make a vow to Yahweh and pay it. And Yahweh will smite Egypt, smiting, but healing, so they will return to Yahweh, and he'll be moved by their entreaty and will heal them. In that day, there'll be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians will come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. What kind of worship? Well, let's see. In that day, Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom Yahweh of hosts has blessed, saying, blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Look at that. I, that is incredibly shocking to the original reader right there in his or her life circumstances in which these peoples are not friendly to Israel. They blaspheme Israel's God, you know, continually attacking, killing their kings, you know, all this, all this kind of thing. How can Egypt be God's people, Assyria, the work of his hands and so forth? So look, you know, this is a really long treatment of an answer to Dr. Enz's popular level article, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But, but here's the thing, we, we come up with our own ideas for whatever they're worth, and they're not worth very much. When we depart from scripture, a problem sign is when we apply historical critical thinking to the Bible. So we're already reading the Bible against the grain. And so that's kind of what's happened here. But another um, problem is when we project what we want to see upon the Bible. So, you know, sure, I'm sure a lot of people like the book of Jonah better than Nahum. <laughs> you know, Nahum is filled with war imagery, and it's, it's savage, and it's, it's, a, it's a war movie, basically. I mean, as you're reading it, whereas Jonah, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Enns humorously mentions, for some reason, people think this is a good children's story. <laughs> Well, I don't know, um, because the, the main character, actually, it looks like he doesn't get it, you know, through the, what God is doing in his gracious offering of forgiveness to the Ninevites. This story is crucial. It's important in its day. It's important after its day. You know, so it's, yes, it's important in the time of the exile, but let's place it where it goes in what the Bible says its, it's, it's uh, placement in history is. And let's read it in the context of the whole scripture, you know? So, I mean, is this the time to, to bring up, could Jonah have been placed in the belly of a great fish? Well, of course he could. God can do that. You know, the, the God who speaks creation into existence, yeah, he can do that. <laughs> you know, the God who can call the Ninevites to repentance is, is that a bigger miracle? You know, you know, yes, he can do that. The God who can place his own spirit in you, if you repent and come to faith in Christ, yes, that God can do that. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you like the content here, you can subscribe by clicking on the icon on the bottom right. Then you can hit the bell for notifications. I upload a new video every Wednesday and every Saturday. I've provided links to Dr. Callahan's work in the video description below. Have an awesome week, and for my brothers and sisters in the Lord, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all always. I will see you all in the next video. God's blessings on your week.